Good morning and welcome to St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church in Peterborough, Ontario, where we are living, learning, and sharing the love of Jesus Christ in our complicated world. Let us worship God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Remember Jesus, who is the light of our world. Our hymn is, Here I Am to Worship. come before God with our prayers of adoration and confession. Lord God, we bless you and praise you. You have forgiven our sin, healed us in times of illness, and gave your own life for our salvation. We are so grateful for your unwavering love and mercy. Your goodness has been poured out on us until it overflows. 
We praise you for coming into our world to teach us your way. We confess that it is the opposite to all that comes naturally to us. We do not want to serve others or put them first. We seek our own glory. We desire wealth regardless of what it costs others. We are willing to use people so that we can get ahead or look good. We want honor, but we do not want to suffer for it. We think of ourselves before others, and we think of ourselves as better than others. Knowing our tendencies, we praise you because you do not repay us according to the things we've done, but you offer us mercy and grace. Forgive us and change us. We thank you for all our brothers and sisters in Christ, asking you to bless them. May our worship be acceptable in your sight, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Amen. God speaks to us. And we listen. Let's pray for illumination before we read. Lord Jesus, you laid down your life for your friends. As we hear your word, give us greater love for others so that we may put them first. Amen. And our first reading from Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 24. One day, on our way to the place of prayer, a slave girl ran into us. She was a psychic, and with her fortune-telling, made a lot of money for the people who owned her. She started following Paul around, calling everyone's attention to us by yelling out, These men are working for the Most High God. They're laying out the road of salvation for you. She did this for a number of days, until Paul finally fed up with her, turned and commanded the spirit that possessed her. Out, out in the name of Jesus Christ. Get out of her. And it was gone, just like that. When her owners saw that their lucrative little business was suddenly bankrupt, they went after Paul and Silas, roughed them up and dragged them into the marketplace. Then the police arrested them and pulled them into, the co into a court with the accusation, these men are disturbing the peace, dangerous Jewish agitators, subverting our Roman law and order. By this time, the crowd had turned into a restless mob out for blood. The judges went along with the mob had Paul and Silas' clothes ripped off and ordered a public beating. After beating them black and blue, they threw them into jail, telling the jailkeeper to put them under heavy guard so there would be no chance of escape. He did just that, threw them into the maximum security cell in the jail and clamped leg irons on the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel reading is from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. James and John, Zebedee's sons, came up to him. Teacher, we have something we want you to do for us. What is it? I'll see what I can do. Arrange it, they said, so that we will be awarded the highest places of honor in your glory, one of us on your right, the other at your left. Jesus said, you have no idea what you're asking. Are you capable of drinking the cup I drink, of being baptized in the baptism I'm about to be plunged into? 
Sure, they said, why not? Jesus said, come to think of it, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized in my baptism. But as to awarding places of honor, that's not my business. There are other arrangements made for that. When the other 10 heard of this conversation, they lost their tempers with James and John. Jesus got them together to settle things down. You've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, he said. And when people get a little power, how quickly it goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The young lady pictured in this uh, photo is Sarah Tchaikovsky. And back in 2008, Sarah was a college senior playing for the championship of the Great Northwest Athletic Conference Softball League. In the second inning, she hit the ball and watched it sail right out of the park. And the fans cheered. It was her first home run ever. Rounding the bases, Sari realized she had failed to touch first. So she turned back. But through a twist of fate and a twist of her knee, she found herself down on the ground with a torn ligament. She had all the time in the world, so she began crawling back in agony to first base. It was quickly apparent that she would not be able to round all the bases and get home. According to the rules, if anyone from her team helped her, she'd be automatically out. Everyone watched, not knowing what to do. That's when Mallory Holtman and Liz Wallace, two players from the opposing team, stepped up. The crowd watched in amazement as they carried Sarah around the bases, making sure to tap her left foot on each base. Sarah made her home run and the stadium went wild. But the real heroes of the day were Mallory and Liz, whose team lost the game but won the day. Oh, I can't read that story without getting teary. Why is it that acts of sacrifice touch us so deeply? perhaps because they go against our human nature while demonstrating the best in people. Dr. Michael McGee confesses, when I was younger, I would speed towards the parking space to get it before the other car. I was selfish. Even now, I experience impulses to gratify and soothe myself before considering the needs of others. I still have seeds of selfishness. Putting others first is not our first impulse. It's not second nature to us. Yet it is a value and an action at the core of our Christian faith. The cross is all about putting others first. Jesus did not die for himself. He died for humanity, for you and I. He put us first. This is absolutely consistent with his teaching. James and John came up with a great idea. They assume that in heaven, someone's going to have the honor of sitting beside Jesus, so it might as well be them. In case this might be done on a first come first serve basis, like calling shotgun before a car ride, they approach Jesus to be sure they'll be at the top of the list. You can imagine just how impressed Jesus was by this. Regardless, he dealt with them respectfully and use their question as a teaching moment. He asked them, are you capable of drinking the cup I drink, of being baptized into the baptism 
I'm about to be plunged into. He was, of course, referring to his torturous death on the cross, his sacrifice for others. The very fact that James and John even approached Jesus looking for glory for themselves tells us the answer to that question. But without giving it much thought, James and John insist that they can. Knowingly, Jesus responds, well, come to think of it, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized in my baptism, that as to awarding places, places of honor, that's not my business. There are other arrangements for that. Now, the other disciples aren't much better. Upon overhearing the request, they're miffed with James and John for being so presumptuous. Who's to say it wouldn't be one of them who gets to sit beside Jesus? Jesus set things straight. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served, and then to give his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. The kingdom of God is not about who's most powerful. It's not about pushing others around or oppressing them. It's not about getting honors or even taking credit. It's upside down to everything we think. In God's world, God's way, the first is last. Leaders are servants. Others come first. Jesus is our role model. In Philippians 2, 3, and 4, Paul directs us, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. This too is opposite to the wor what the world teaches us. A meme I read states, the problem with putting others first is you teach them you come second. In the book of Acts, Paul and Silas are drawn into a situation where the motivations of selfish ambition and self-interest has caused some people to exploit a vulnerable girl. The girl suffered due to poverty and economic oppression. She had been bought and sold as a slave, and her owners had no regard for her as a person only as an object they could use. She also suffered due to a different kind of oppression. She was possessed by a demon. The demon gave her the power of divination, which was quite a perk for the owners. They sold her ability to see the future for their own financial gain. She was quite a lucrative asset to their livelihood. To her owners, she was a cash cow, not a human being. When Paul and Silas show up, the spirit within the girl recognizes them as people of faith. She follows them around for days, announcing, these men are working for the most high God. They're laying out the road of salvation for you. Now, we might think that the free advertisement would be welcomed by Paul and Silas, but it wasn't. She tried Paul's patience. Terry and I recently had a similar experience. We were walking in downtown London, Ontario, and we passed a man who looked like he was without a home. He was talking to himself and shooing away invisible things. Obviously, the poor man had some mental health issues. But when Terry and I passed him, he looked at us and began talking about reading the Bible and prayer. This quickly turned to cursing us in the most colorful language. He followed us up the street and back and at one point threatened Terry physically. Later, we both related our experience to this one of Paul and Silas. In our culture, of course, you don't go up to ill people without homes and attempt to deliver them. However, Paul turned to the woman and commanded the demon to come out of her in the name of Jesus Christ, and it did. We would think that was a cause for celebration. But the woman's owners saw their gold mine disappear. Without the demon, the girl was just a girl with no remarkable powers. Not only had they lost their source of income, but now they were stuck with a slave they'd have to feed. Before we judge these people harshly, we need to consider if they are really that different from us. We live well at the expense of others. 
We have closets full of clothes made by children in sweatshops halfway around the world. Our lifestyle is luxurious in comparison to most of the world because we purchase goods from unethical com companies. Our bank accounts expand because we invest in countries that oppress their own people, persecute Christians and others, deceive their trading partners and are aggressive to other nations. In short, we live well because we don't even think about the people affected, let alone put them first. Jesus told his disciples, you've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around. When people get a little power, how quickly it goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Booker T. Washington was an American educator, writer, speaker, and an advisor to several American presidents of the United States. That's a little redundant. He was a leader in his community, promoting entrepreneurs and education as a means to move forward. All this would be remarkable for anyone, but Washington was born into slavery in 1856. So he knew a thing or two about oppression. And Washington advised, if you want to lift yourself up, lift up someone else. In our world, it seems that we cannot lift up one group of people without bringing down another. We are locked into a power dynamic structured to lift up some at the expense of others. It seems that someone must be on top and someone must be on the bottom in order for the top person to be validated. In God's kingdom, the playing field gets leveled. The goal is to lift up, first of all, God, and then everyone else. Most people push against being the person on the bottom and certainly wouldn't choose to be the slave in order to benefit or glorify, to lift up or to save someone else. But it is not that way with the followers of Jesus. We are to serve and esteem others. The question in how is, how does, that level, how does that level the playing field? How does becoming less lift us up? A farmer hears of a wise man visiting in a nearby village. He sets out to ask the man a question. Why, even though I work hard, am I still poor? Along the way, he meets three people who give him food and a night's lodgings and befriend him. They also have questions, and since they can't make the trek themselves, they ask the farmer if he will bring their questions to the wise man. The farmer agrees, but when he arrives, the wise man informs him he can only ask three questions. So now the farmer has a dilemma because he has four questions. He considers which person's question he can leave out, but concludes that instead of asking his own question, he'll ask the questions of his new friends. The farmer journeys back and gives his friends the answers. In return, his friends thank him with three gold coins and invite him to return at any time. The farmer leaves with a pocket of money and a heart filled with love. In the process, he has discovered the answer to his question. Putting aside our own needs gives us what we really need. In a research study, people were given money to spend. Half the subjects were instructed to give the money, to spend the money on themselves, and the other half were instructed to give the money to someone in need. At the end of the day, the subjects who gave the money away were happier. Giving is good for us. And we shouldn't be surprised Jesus told us it was the way to go. Putting others first not only makes them happier, it makes us happier, and it makes the world a better place. Now, do you remember Dr. Michael McGee, whose goal it was to get the best parking spot? He concurs. What I've learned is that I'm better off if I put others first. When I let someone go in front of me in line, I feel good. Last week, I canceled a meeting and went to visit my mother-in-law, who is recovering from an illness. I felt, it felt good to do this. Recently, this picture has been circulating on the internet. It shows a man and his son walking through the rain. The father is soaked to the skin as he holds the umbrella over his son 
to shield him from the downpour. As a loving father, he is putting his son first. He is also teaching his son how to love because love is putting others first. Putting others first may not bring us glory or power or money, but it brings us peace and joy. And just as Jesus' sacrifice on the cross models for us the way that God's kingdom becomes a reality on earth, perhaps we will model the same for others. After giving up his place in a wealthy family, living in poverty and devoting his life to others, St. Francis of Assisi concluded, above all the grace and the gifts that Christ gives to his beloved is that of overcoming self. Amen. All glory be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to a time of silent prayer and reflection. Amen. Please join with me in our offertory prayer. Lord God, we bring our gifts. In doing so, we deprive ourselves of something, yet we bring our gifts happily. Use them and use us to reach out to others. Amen. And our hymn is Forgive One Another. <laughs> come together with our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. Creator God, we thank you today that you have seen fit to include us in your kingdom. We thank you for Jesus, who is willing to give up the glory of heaven to become a servant for us. If this wasn't enough, he gave up his life to die a horrible death for our salvation. 
We thank you for putting us before your own son. We thank you, Jesus, for putting us before your own safety and well-being. We thank you for the many blessings and gifts that you give us. We are grateful for the emotional blessings we receive through family and friends and through a sense of purpose. We are grateful for the physical blessings of good health in body and mind and providing for all our needs in abundance. We are grateful for our spiritual blessings of forgiveness, acceptance, and a relationship with you. We look forward to the day when we will be welcomed into your realm. We pray for your church. In some places, Christians suffer and even die for their faith. Give them wisdom and courage. Closer to home, churches are closing and people are hurt and grieving. Comfort them. In our own congregation, we are missing one another and the times we share together. We are in a time of change and transition, which both scares us and excites us. Give us the ability to put others first. We pray for our world in all its wonder and beauty, in all its brokenness and sin, in all its darkness and evil. Shine your light so that people may turn to follow you we think now of particular places, people, or problems we have heard of this week. We pray for those who are sick, asking for healing. For those who are suffering mentally, asking for peace. For those who are grieving, asking for comfort. For those who rebel against you, asking for opening hearts. And for those who seek their own good, asking for humility. Thank you for hearing these prayers and for your loving providence in which you consider all our needs. Hear us now as we pray with Jesus saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn is, They Will Know We Are Christians By Our Love. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love They will know we are Christians by our love We will walk with each other
us his one and only son and all praise to the spirit who makes us all as one and they'll know we are christians by our love by our love they will know we are christians by our love We go out to a world in need to share the hope we have in Christ, to weep with those who weep, and to rejoice with those who rejoice, to serve others as Christ serves us. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and always. Amen.